and welcome to everyone watching to one more episode of Crónica Testimonial. Today, I want to introduce to the audience a very sensitive topic that has only in recent years begun to be discussed in the media, particularly here in the West. And what and that, that issue is the issue of children's rights abuses, particularly recruitment of child soldiers. To discuss this, I have with me children's rights expert, Mrs. Joe Becker, who's joining us from New York City. Welcome, Mrs. Becker. So glad to have you with us. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. So Mrs. Becker is a professor of human rights advocacy at Columbia University, as well as an author. She's currently the advocacy director of the Children's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch, an international NGO focusing on human rights advocacy. So their experts often meet with governments, the UN rebel groups and others to see that human rights policy is changed and implemented. Um, so basically, I'm going to go ahead with my first question, and that is, how is children's rights advocacy different to any other human rights advocacy field in terms of the challenges to bring it to the fore of the international community's conversation? Well, that's a great question. I think children are different in a number of ways. One is that they're just more vulnerable to abuses because of their young age and their immaturity. And so adults, unfortunately, will often try and take advantage of children. And the fact that they're more susceptible to exploitation or manipulation. So we see employers hiring children in child labor because they can pay children less, or commanders in military forces recruiting children because they can manipulate them into, you know, into fighting more easily than, than adults. And of course, there's a worldwide epidemic of, of sexual exploitation of, of children. And then at the same time, you know, children, they don't vote and they have very little access to policymakers to, you know, ask for changes on their behalf. And so that makes it all the more important for the human rights movement to speak up for them and to advocate on their behalf. Um, so what have you personally learned throughout your career about the potential for change that advocacy has? And what are some of, of the changes that you've seen in terms of children's rights that have motivated you to keep going in your fight for change? Yeah, well, I've worked on children's rights now for almost 23 years. And it's actually a really dynamic field. And we still have many, many challenges, but we've also seen a lot of progress. So one example is that up until the COVID-19 pandemic, there had been tremendous progress on reducing child labor around the world. Um, from 2000 to 2016, child labor rates dropped by almost 40%. That's almost 100 million children that were um, removed from, from child labor situations. Yeah. And at the same time, governments have done a much better job of making sure that children can enjoy their right to education. Uh, the enrollment of children in schools has gone up by almost 100 million over the last 20 years. And when I first started working on children's rights, the first issue I started working on was the recruitment and use of child soldiers in armed conflicts. And one of the big uh, advances that we've seen there is that the UN adopted a treaty on child soldiers that has now been ratified by 170 countries around the world. And we've seen many of those countries change their laws, change their policies. And some countries that were previously, previously using child soldiers no longer do so. So it's those kinds of um, advances and uh, you know, achievements that make me encouraged about continuing to do this work. Um, so going on to the, the latest report that you mentioned, um, so it, it documents horrific violations against children in Northeast Nigeria perpetrated by Boko Haram and uh, the Civilian Joint Task Force, as well as the Nigerian Security Forces. These include verified cases of military recruitment, abductions, and sexual violence. Would you give us a brief overview of the complexities that play in the political and military context of Nigeria as of recently? and explain what is the role of children in armed conflict in some areas of the country? Yeah, well, uh, in Northeast Nigeria, there's been a terrible conflict that's been happening since about 2009, so about a dozen years now. And at the heart is an insurgency by Boko Haram, 
and their name, Boko Haram, means Western education is forbidden. And so they have deliberately targeted schools and teachers. They've destroyed about 1,500 schools in Northeast Nigeria um, as part of their, you know, as part of their program. Um, there have been more than 40,000 people killed during this conflict, and over 2 million people have been driven from their homes. Boko Haram has recruited at least 8,000 children, probably more. They take boys and girls. They often force girls to marry their uh, commanders. They make children join in the fighting. And unfortunately, they force many children to carry out suicide attacks. It's, it's really horrific. Now, on the other hand, the government also has committed abuses. You mentioned the Civilian Joint Task Force. That's sort of a um, pro-military group that for until a few years ago was also recruiting child soldiers. And the government has been responsible for unlawful killings and torture. And they've rounded up thousands of people in the Northeast as suspected Boko Haram members, including many, many children. And many of these children and adults have been detained in really horrible military prisons. At least 3,000 children have been uh, detained. And two years ago, I went to Nigeria and I met a number of these children and interviewed them about their experiences. And uh, I met children who uh, were only 10 years old, who had been detained when they were five. And so, you know, clearly a five-year-old has no, you know, knowing involvement with Boko Haram. So unfortunately, many of these children were being held without, without evidence. Why is the recruitment of children, of child soldiers, important for these different groups, including Boko Haram? Well, there are several reasons. One is sometimes uh, armed extremist groups like Boko Haram um, don't get much support from the adult population. And so they resort to forcibly recruiting or abducting children just to bring more uh, fighters into their ranks. Um, that was certainly the case with the Lord's Resistance Army in Northern Uganda. Uh, there are some estimates years ago that 90% of their fighters were recruited, forcibly recruited as children. So just way, a way to get their numbers up is, is one element. Uh, a second element is just the nature of children. Children are, are young, they're impressionable, um, they're easily manipulated. And so they may be more willing to uh, follow orders than adults. They may be more easily intimidated, more easily brainwashed. Um, less likely to question the orders that they're being given. And so that's been a big motivator for many armed groups to, to recruit children. Um, they often see them as cannon fodder. They don't value them as much as their adult troops. And so sometimes they use them for the most dangerous roles or sending them to the front lines of combat as um, you know, easily sacrificed uh, members of their group. Well, the UN uh, Security Council has undertaken several investigations in recent years documenting the atrocities that children are exposed to in areas of conflict, including being held in military prisons over supposed ties, as you mentioned, with Boko Haram. Um, what are the conditions that children face in those prisons? And how does the Security Council monitor children's rights violations in conflict areas, as well as to ensure that policy changes are implemented? That's a great question. Yeah, we've seen a real disturbing trend in recent years uh, with a real rise in the number of children that are being detained for suspected involvement with armed groups. And this is really contrary to what international law says, which is that these children have been recruited you know, in violation of their rights. Um, they're being exploited and they should be treated as victims, not perpetrators. Uh, what they really need is rehabilitation and schooling and help to get back to the, into their communities. But instead, especially in contexts where armed groups are being designated as terrorist or you know, extremist, uh, we see children being treated as criminals. So for example, in, in Northeast Nigeria, you know, thousands of children have been rounded up and detained in a military prison um, called Giwa Barracks in Northeast Nigeria. And the children that I interviewed who had been in this military prison described really horrible conditions. 
Um, cells were packed so tightly that children could barely move during the day and couldn't even turn over at night because they were just packed one next to the, another. They described overwhelming heat and just an overpowering stench from lack of sanitation. No activities. Uh, many said they had no contact with their families, no contact with lawyers. They had no idea, you know, what, if any, charges were filed against them and how long it would be before they got out. It was just, for many, it felt like a hopeless situation. Um, and in many cases, the government was holding them simply because they came from areas where Boko Haram had been active. And oftentimes children were apprehended when they were running away from Boko Haram um, and you know, certainly had no involvement with, with Boko Haram. Now, thankfully the government has released um, many of these children, but they don't allow the United Nations access to verify whether there are still children in the military prison or you know, what the situation is. And unfortunately, this is a situation that we see worldwide. So in Afghanistan, for example, children are being detained because it was suspected that they were part of the Taliban. Or in Iraq, children have been detained and even prosecuted for suspected involvement with, with ISIS. And this is something that the UN Security Council is monitoring. Uh, UN country teams around the world are collecting information about detention. Uh, the UN Sec Secretary General has been reporting on it, and both the Secretary General and the UN Security Council have been calling on countries, you know, not to detain children for association with armed groups and instead to provide them with help to reintegrate to their communities and to, to get back into school and to really treat them like victims and, and not criminals. So um, would you explain for our audience, what is the role in this monitoring process uh, that the Security Council undertakes? What is the role of the list of shame and uh, how important is it to ensure the protection of children in the armed conflict? Yeah, so about 20 years ago, the UN Security Council recognized that abuses against children in armed conflict situations were very serious and a threat to international peace and security. And so since then, they've started paying close attention to um, children being killed in conflict, being recruited as child soldiers, instances of sexual violence, attacks on their schools, um, and, and more recently, detention. So in about 15 years ago, they set up a, a monitoring system so that in conflict countries, UN personnel on the ground would start documenting all these uh, violations, these instances of abuses against children, and really providing data to the Security Council and to the Secretary General. And so every year, the Secretary General provides a comprehensive report of what's happening in 15 or 20 countries around the world. Um, you know, how children are being affected, how many children are being killed, how many have been recruited, what's happening, what governments and armed groups have committed to do. And as part of that, he produces a list every year uh, of the governments and armed groups. He names what forces are committing these violations against children. And we call this the list of shame because you know, mostly governments and armed groups, they don't wanna be named in this list because there's a lot of, a lot of stigma. Uh, they don't wanna be known for committing human rights violations, especially against children. So this list is pretty important. And the Security Council has said that once um, a government or an armed group appears on this list, the only way to get off is to sign an action plan with the United Nations and to specify what they're going to do, what measures they're going to take to stop recruiting children or to stop killing children and to you know, end these violations. And if they fulfill this plan and end their violations, then they come off the list and they no longer have that, that shame of being um, listed. Um, so I understand that an, an analysis of the list was recently published. Um, would you explain for our audience what the findings were and how worrying they are? Yeah, well, first, I should say that in many instances, the list has been really successful. So over the last you know, 20 years, there are more than 30 
armed groups and governments that have signed action plans with the United Nations. They've acknowledged that they were recruiting child soldiers or that they were committing other violations. And they made concrete commitments to, to address them. And you know, there have been a number of cases where uh, parties have fulfilled their, their commitments and have stopped their violations. So like the governments of Uganda or Chad or the Democratic Republic of Congo have all stopped recruiting children. And even armed groups like in the Philippines or in Cote d'Ivoire have, have stopped violations. So the list can be really powerful, but there was a report just a few weeks ago by some international child rights experts that looked at the list and UN documentation over the last decade. And they found that unfortunately there's some real discrepancies and there are groups, especially governments that have committed large numbers of violations against children, but have never report been, been on the list. Um, and there are other parties that have been taken off the list when they shouldn't have been. So one prominent example is the Saudi-led uh, Saudi coalition, which has been involved in the conflict in Yemen. And according to the UN, they've been responsible for thousands of child, child deaths and injuries during the last few years. And yet the, security, the secretary general has taken them off his list of shame. And one of the reasons is because Saudi Arabia is extremely powerful and they give millions of dollars to the United Nations every year. And in fact, a few years ago, they told the Secretary General, if you don't take us off the list, we will stop giving that money for UN programs. So they essentially blackmailed him and, and he was taken off the list. Uh, another prominent example is the uh, Armed Forces of Israel. They have also you know, been responsible for you know, hundreds, if not thousands of deaths of Palestinian children. And yet they have also not been listed. And in part, the United States, which is one of their biggest allies, has intervened with the Secretary General to try and pressure him to keep Israel off the list. So what this uh, group of international experts uh, said in their report is that you know, there are too many contradictions here. Um, instances where the documentation from the UN and the data that's available does not correlate to the governments and armed groups that are on this list. And the, the Secretary General really needs to do a better job of looking at the evidence and listing everybody who has committed you know, significant violations against children, regardless of how powerful they are. Um, the list is not gonna be effective if powerful entities or some entities get preferential treatment. Everybody should be treated equally. And if they commit violations, you know, the way to get off the list is basically just to stop, you know, to, to end their recruitment of children or stop killing children uh, rather than trying to pressure the secretary general. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, uh, Mrs. Becker. But before you go, I have one last question. And this is about uh, the current COVID-19 situation. What has it revealed about um, the the prominence of uh, child uh, rights advocacy uh, on the on the agenda of the international community and what needs improving in your opinion yeah no i think the covid 19 pandemic has really revealed um some underlying problems with how society treats children and you know unfortunately during the pandemic on the, the positive side is that children have been less affected in terms of their, their health. You know, there have been fewer children hospitalized or who have died from, from the coronavirus. So there's sort of an assumption that children are doing okay. But, you know, the school closures, for example, have had a massive impact. You know, over 90% of the world's students were forced out of school. That's 1.4 billion children worldwide. And many of them have now been out of school for over a year. Um, and even though some countries have tried to, you know, start distance learning, Zoom classes, television classes, what that's done is un unearthed how many discrepancies there are or the, the vast disparities between poor children and more privileged children. You know, many millions of children around the world have no access to the internet. 
Many of them don't even have electricity. And so keeping up with their schoolwork during the pandemic has been impossible. And so they're being left further and further behind. And so as schools reopen, you know, it's a real challenge to governments to make sure that children come back and that they have the tools that they need to really keep up with their studies. Um, one thing that I've been looking at personally, I've been conducting a project looking at how the COVID-19 pandemic is leading to an increase in child labor around the world. And, you know, many families have been hit really hard. So parents have lost their jobs, they've lost their income, um, you know, they no longer have access to markets. And so they've been really struggling. And meanwhile, children are out of school. And so many of them see their parents having a hard time uh, paying for housing or paying for food. And so they've felt enormous pressure to go to work. And so in several countries, we have been documenting how children have you know, taken on work responsibilities and are working really long hours and horrible jobs for you know, really low pay just to try and help their families along during, during this crisis. And you know, our, our fear is that many of these children, uh, once they're in a work situation, they may never go back to school. And some of their you know, work is clearly hazardous. They're putting their health at risk. They're putting their education at risk. And the pandemic is really reversing a lot of the progress that we've seen over the last 20 years. So, you know, there are a lot of challenges that the pandemic has brought to children. And I think, you know, governments really need to pay attention to children's rights as they plan for, you know, um, their COVID response and how to build back better. Um, there are a lot of ways in which governments can help um, families that have hit, been hit hard by the pandemic so that children don't suffer more than they need to. Um, I understand that um, there were some reports that um, also children ha have kind of been left behind when it comes to um, security in prisons and the conditions that were not in keeping with uh, distance or um, things of that nature regarding the virus. So how has that affected uh, ch uh, child soldiers in prisons? Yeah, that's a great question. So after the pandemic started, uh, many governments started realizing that prisoners were at particular risk because they're held in close confinement. They often have you know, no opportunity to social distance or maintain you know, sanitation. Um, they may not have masks. And so in many countries, the rates of COVID-19 in prisons are far, far higher than in other populations. And we started looking at what governments were doing. And in many countries, governments have been releasing prisoners, low, um, low risk prisoners, prisoners who are nearing the end of their sentence, older prisoners, others that were at risk to try and respond to COVID-19. But we found that children were often being left out and children were not being released. And in some instances, as we discussed before, children who were accused of involvement with armed groups were explicitly excluded so in Afghanistan, for example, you know, there have been thousands of prisoners released, but no children who were you know, accused of being part of the Taliban. And then, you know, meanwhile, for those children who are in prison, you know, their conditions may be worse. Sometimes governments will impose restrictions or you know, health precautions for, um, for children, but it may mean then that the child is in essential you know, solitary confinement or they no longer have access to recreational facilities or to, you know, to educational programs in the prison. And so a lot of children, you know, number one, they're not being released. And number two, they're even worse off than they were before. And so this is an area that really needs um, attention as well. Well, Mrs. Becker, thank you so much for being here with us today. And thank you so much for your time and for the work that you do. It was my pleasure. Thanks for your interest. Appreciate it.